thank you so much for being here. So welcome to this presentation from Hugo's desk. Uh, today we are going to jump right into it. Uh, we're going to be talking about working from home for creatives. This is going to be a do-it-yourself studio guide. This uh, presentation is brought to you by BenQ and of course by Hugo's desk as well. Working from home. Everyone is now calling it WF. H, I, I guess. <laughs> There's like a lot of reasons for us to work from home, of course, you know. But obviously the most important right now is that we have the pandemic currently. And I really hope that everyone uh, is safe, everyone that is actually here on this uh, webinar, and I hope your family is safe as well. I have other reasons for working from home. I've been working from home for six years, okay? So I have other reasons. One of my biggest reasons is actually this. Uh, I live in London, so... Uh, commuting to work is horrible, as you all know. A lot of people here on the audience are from London as well. Um, and I didn't really enjoy this. The other reason I didn't really like to work in studios uh, after my 15 years of working in studios uh, is this. As you all know, uh, working uh, inside a studio, especially if you're working in commercials, you get a lot of this. You get a lot of more to the right, more to the left. And I kind of got fed up of it because if I work remotely, they are just remotely, you know, they're not really next to me, which is great. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people think that working remotely is this. Uh, this is not working remotely, <laughs> at least not for me. You know, working remotely for me is like having a proper studio, just like when I was working inside a company. The a proper studio means having proper equipment and having, and that's why we're here. We're here to discuss what kind of equipment you should have and also what kind of equipment works for your different budgets, you know. One of the reasons I'm doing this webinar is really because of this sentence from Steve Jobs that was actually, it was, was mentioned in 1995, which is incredible. The smallest company in the world can look as large as the largest company in the world on the web. And that is really true, especially for my company. You know, my company is run from here. <laughs> it's my home. Uh, it's where I am actually sitting now. Uh, this is my office. And I run this company. I've been running it for six years. And sometimes I have 20 people. Sometimes I have 10 people. Sometimes I have five people working with me. All of us working remotely all over the world. The other sentence that really drives me to work from home was something that one of my favorite science fiction authors wrote uh, in 74 before I was born. <laughs> and they, he actually said, they will make it possible to live really anywhere we live. He's by, basically, by the way, he's talking about computers. Uh, what he did here really was that he basically foreseen internet, really. That was what the cool thing about this. And he basically said, they will make it possible f to live really anywhere we, we like. Any businessman, any executive could like almost anywhere on earth and still do this business through a device like this. He's talking about the computer. It means we won't be stuck in cities. We will live out in the country or wherever we please and still carry out complete interactions with other human beings as well as computers. And this is really, it's, it's, it's true. Like we should all kind of like not be so much on cities and we shouldn't really, even from an environmental point of view. And I know, I know now with the pandemic is a bit tricky, but we'll, we'll get to that. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna, gonna move on, okay? So let's talk about the office space because if you're gonna work from home, you have to have some kind of office, right? That's the whole point. So first of all, obviously, this is kind of what people think an home office is, you know, like a really slick office uh, that always looks really pretty. And um, it doesn't really work that way, but, um, I, I kind of gather these photos from the web because I was kind of curious to see how an home office for people is. And it's really far from the truth. Although it's funny because for years and years, people have been working remotely on other industries. For example, like people have worked uh, remotely on the sound industry for a long, long time. People have their own studios where they record albums. They do all sorts of things. So it's funny that we are now debating the working from home. But so many other other industries already done it so long ago, um, and obviously I understand that all of this is too too much money, and I, I understand that no one is ever going to buy all this equipment. This is the equipment that usually a company buys. But if you're going to take it seriously to work from home, then of course you could always buy the equipment anyway. But you could buy cheaper versions of the equipment, and that's why we are here today. That's why we're talking about this <laughs> today. And um, obviously. Uh, I don't know if Victor Perez is online, <laughs> but if Victor Perez was online, I am sure uh, you would tell me that this is the way to go. This is his home studio. Obviously, this is not a home studio, not for me. This is a cinema. <laughs> and obviously, I would love to have something like this, but not everyone here on the chat can actually 
afford something like this, as much as it is a beautiful studio. Moving on from Victor Perez's amazing setup, uh, for a lot of us, working from home is this. And I really want to leave this, you know, because people think that they're just going to be like with their rough clothing and with a laptop on having breakfast. And first of all, this is really not good because you shouldn't really have food next to a computer. <laughs> That's the first thing I would say. But anyway... A lot of us have old houses, you know, we have messy houses, old houses, like I know, because I'm I'm in London and my house is horrible. <laughs> and we have messy desks, you know, and we put like monitors on top of, of books and we have no no control over our desk sometimes. Look, just look at this desk. This is amazing. Like I can't even understand how someone can even find anything. But regardless of that, like for me, it all started by by planning a bit, you know, like I, I kind of sit down and I, I had my house and I had an extra be bedroom, which was great. You kind of have to have an extra bedroom, otherwise it's not going to work. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that then I started organizing myself. That's not me, of course, by the way. <laughs> but I truly started organizing myself. I started kind of like making some schematics of how my office should look like. I started kind of like putting, okay, should I have two monitors, one on top of each other? Should I have one monitor here, one monitor there? Should I have like three monitors in a row and then maybe the scopes down here? Maybe I should have like the Xbox there and maybe the computer would be on that side. You kind of start like messing around with layouts. And I really would recommend you to do that because you need to kind of find your best layout because it's you're going to spend most of your life in this room you know when you're working for years and years to come uh, obviously when i first when i finally decided with my layout then what i had to do of course was to strip everything out of the office and then this is the painful part of it cables everywhere this is actually the last time i stripped my office i this is how it was looking when i was like controlling it and and the other thing i would just say just before we go is that the it is important for you to make sure you have a spare room it doesn't need to be big you know it could be a really small room it could be a cupboard it doesn't matter as long as i have a key it's good to have a key but anyway i'm 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 getting ahead of myself <laughs> i'm getting ahead of myself i'm rushing through this presentation i don't want to rush let's really discuss how hugo's desk really appeared and what type of equipment i have here please keep in mind that my the reasoning be behind this webinar is to really show you how to make a, a studio Either if you are a visual effects artist or if you are an editor or if you are like a grading artist or even a composer, it doesn't really mean you have to buy all of this, okay? I want you all to understand that it took me five years to get to this, okay? So on the beginning, I had nothing. Slowly but surely been developing my studio over the years. One key tip I give you is that every time you do a project, maybe put 20% on that of the that budget into equipment, you know, so if you're getting like a thousand pounds, make sure 200 pounds goes to equipment, you know, like I always do that on all my projects. Anyway, it all started kind of at the mill, you know, at the mill, I was already having an office. This was my office at the mill. So I, I was the head of Nuke. So I had my own suite where I could have my clients and you can kind of see it's already similar. This is, of course, Fee, one of my compositors, very talented compositor, very talented. As you can see, it's already close to what I had. Like, I have, like, a, a plasma with a, a Rex 9 graded monitor where I could preview. This is Nuke Studio running Nuke Studio on a Mac Pro. And then I had another second machine, a Linux box here for compositing. And then you can see I had routers. I already had sound mixing here. I already had a telephone. So it was already kind of growing a bit like that. So this was kind of the first Hugo's desk, really. Uh, but obviously I left the mill and when I left the mill, I had no equipment. So I, I bought a laptop. That's what I started with. Hugo's desk, believe it or not, started with a laptop five years ago. Went and This is why I'm showing you. I'm showing you this story because I want you to understand that you don't go directly to this. Okay. You never should go directly to this. What you should do is you should advance step by step. I got a laptop and of course I was traveling a lot. I was doing a lot of presentations for, for BenQ. I was doing a lot of presentations for the Foundry. So I started like, you know, mounting my laptop on hotel rooms, you know, so I would have the TV on the hotel room as my second monitor, for example. I would have like, you know, a sound card so I could record audio for classrooms. I would have like, a, you know, a way like I would set up on any hotel, really. I, had a, I would have a, an external rate system so I could play back the clips, although this laptop was very slow. I could at least have a rate system so I could play back the clips in real time. And slowly but surely it was working, but, you know. You know me, like, you just have to be better, right? And that didn't really work for long, because I, I did one project with that laptop. I did the Just Cost 3 trailer with that laptop, but I kind of dropped it and said, okay, enough is enough. I'm a professional now, so I've left the mill. Let's get a, a real computer. So the reason 2014 comes, and 
I bought a Mac Pro, not really because it's a Mac or a PC. I'm not, I'm software agnostic. I use Macs and PCs and Linux. And, but the reason I bought this was because um, this is for me, in my view, the fastest laptop that exists, right? So this, this is a laptop for me because it's so small. And so I can carry it, you know? And the cool thing about this is because this has 12 cores, which no laptop has, not yet at least. It has 128 gigs of RAM, which practically no laptop has, really. And it can also run triple boot. You know, I can run Linux, Mac OS, and Windows on it. So I'm completely flexible with everything. I started using this on offices, on meetings. I started carrying it with me for events. I would start carrying it to other places. And I would always do the same thing. I would have like... I would always use, of course, the cheapest monitor that I could ever find, which was the Wacom uh, tablet, the Syntex. This is the old one, the 19-inch, that still has HDMI in. They don't have HDMI in anymore, which is it's, it's a shame because this is also very good to play PlayStation 4. <laughs> anyway, I would then pack it up. It would be like a package. I could pack up and open and close and open and close and go to my meetings. I would carry the computer on this spherical bag which would be what i would do on a carry-on and then the rest would be the carry-on as well and of course the bigger bag is not a carry-on as of course now uh, obviously i also at this stage i started getting a professional video card so i got an ultra studio mini monitor so i could do thunderbolt into hdmi so that i could preview my video preview into the plasma of the hotel we're going to get back to this. Don't worry. <laughs> and sometimes I would get a bit out of myself. Sometimes when I worked at Ubisoft, I would take all my equipment there. And um, and that meant that I would be completely portable with my Yugo's desk studio. So I would have, you know, in this case, we have two BenQ monitors here, a Blackmagic um, vector scope, and then two RAID systems. And then, of course, the Mac Pro, which is not on the screen. Um, so that would be... Uh, obviously, at some point, I kind of figured oh, I can't really be traveling this much. You know, I have to kind of like start traveling not that much. And so I stuck around in my office. I'm so sorry for the horrible photo that I have in my first office. But this is me, my first London office after I left the mill. This is my spare bedroom on my house. It's, I don't do my office here anymore. But as you can see, this is already the starting point. I have already a BenQ monitor here. I have like a viewport, mon like a, no, sorry, it's a Dell monitor. And then I have like my Mac Pro with my RAID system, I have like my Wacom tablet, and it's already kind of starting, you know, with my consoles here, it's already kind of starting, it's a desk, it, it's a little bit of a desk, uh, but obviously it evolved, I moved the room to a bigger room, and I started having more monitors, I kind of like um, uh, thought, okay, for me to preview this, I have a professional monitor here, but I might need to have a TV, so I, I kind of I did it. I did a lot of different things at this stage. Like I, I was experimenting. I was experimenting with my, my layout. How would I work? This was one of my first layouts, which has scopes as well. And then my second layout, I actually did all of this by myself. So all these little racks of wood you see here, these are all made by myself. So so they they were. I just went to a DOI shop and I basically made them myself and cut them and did all of that. And so that I could hold the computers on top and on the bottom. And this was kind of like the first stage where we had. An LG TV, this is just a consumer TV. And this is really important. I'm showing you this photo because even if you have consumer equipment, it doesn't matter because you can use the consumer equipment. You just have to calibrate the consumer equipment. You know, It is possible to use a regular t shelf TV. This is a TV that I bought for like 200 quid on a supermarket. And you can calibrate it enough for you to get something to work as long as you have scopes. Anyway, and last year I was here. I was pretty happy, but... I wasn't happy the speakers were so close to me. I wanted them on the side. And I wasn't happy that my scopes were too far on the right side. I wanted the scopes to be on the bottom here where the drives are. Uh, so I kind of moved it around. And this is the, the one you know today, the one you saw on my social media and the one we're, we're talking today. As you can see, this is now full-fledged. I have my professional scopes on the left side. I have a professional 10-bit display with Rexon 09 or HDR to preview my, my comp. I have my composite on the middle. I have a secondary machine here just to do stuff like web and iTunes and other, other stuff. I have another professional monitor here. And then I have my scopes and my other scopes. And then, of course, my RAID system, my Mac Pro, and my everything else. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, here's a little advice. Never look to the back, okay? So behind this, it all looks really cool and all pretty. But that's what it looks like on the back. 
<laughs> and that's what we're discussing today. We're discussing what the hell is behind this and how to do it and <laughs> and what exactly is and how do we do this. And again, I can't emphasize enough. <laughs> you know, this took five years. It was a long process. You know, it wasn't really like out of the blue I bought all of this. You know, I, I just want you to know. Okay. So this is the back of my Yugo's desk. Well, anyway, let's talk about hardware. Let's start with that. Computer is the most important part, right? I really want you to to uh, try to avoid the hate you have for this machine, okay? The only reason I bought this machine is because this machine can run triple operating system, okay? I depend on Linux, Mac, and Windows. I need Mac OS for editorial and for grading and for ProRes working, so I have to have a Mac, although I am running triple boot on it. So, no, sorry, at the moment I'm only running dual boot. I'm running triple boot on the other Mac Pro. I'm not running Linux on this one yet, but I bought a Mac Pro. This is my main machine. Doesn't need to need, you do not need to buy a Mac Pro, okay? I just want to emphasize this. Any machine will do, and I will talk about that in the chat. I really want to do a Q&A, and at the end, you can ask me questions of what you think you, sh you think you should buy. For me personally, this works for my pipeline. Obviously, anyone on this chat, if you're just doing editing, you probably just need an AMD 16 core. If you're just doing CG, you probably just need a 12 or 16 core. If you're just doing compositing, you probably can even do it with an 8 core or a 12 core. There are so many variations and so many options, and I'm very happy to discuss this on the Q&A. I use this machine with three hats, okay? <laughs> so I use it for editing, I use it for visual effects, and I use it for grading as well, okay? So that's why it has so much stuff. So it's basically a 28 core, 56 threads, uh, Intel uh, 2.5 gigahertz, 228 gigs of RAM because I'm running a lot of softwares at the same time. It has the Radeon Pro 5700X with 16 uh, VRAM, and then it has two Radeon uh, 7s, so it has three GPUs in total for me to really run Final Cut and DaVinci really fast and Nuke as well. It has an OS with Bootcamp, Partition, Mac OS, and Windows. I'm going to put Linux at some point. And then I has two internal 12 terabytes enterprise drive. It's important for you to understand that enterprise drive is important because it is really much more safer. Okay. Uh, my second machine, this is one of the my top advice. Like This is one of my top advice I give you to all of you. Everyone here should really get a second machine because I, I really feel like it's much easier to have a second machine because you can always leave my first machine doing something and it can be rendering and then you can just jump into the second machine and do something else. I have triple boot on this one. Um, so it's a Mac Pro 2014, 12 core, uh, 128 gigs of RAM, two graphic cards, 700 Ds with six gig RAMs of each and then a two terabyte SSD inside. Now this is my secondary machine for support, email, Photoshop, but it also is my remote machine. You saw that sometimes when I'm traveling, I take it with me. So it is still to this day my, my machine that I travel with. Then I have a third machine. You don't need to have a third machine. The only reason I do a third machine is because I stream a lot on Twitch and I do a lot of video tutorials, as you know. So I have a third machine. This is an old Mac Pro 2012. It, it, you, go to, you can go to eBay and it, it costs like, you know, 500 quid. So it's a 12 cores, um, uh, 3,000 gigahertz, 128 gigs of RAM, one AMD Radeon 580, 8 gigs of VRAM, two SSDs RAIDs for OS, six 12 terabytes inside with enterprise drives. This is kind of my secondary backup. And then a Blackmagic capture card, uh, which is on the back there, which has four HDMIs. The reason for that is because this is my streaming machine. So... I use this uh, DeckLink, which is a quad HDMI recorder, which is only 500 bucks, but you don't need to buy this. You can buy other recorders, but I, I do this because I have my desktop input, my PlayStation, my Xbox. Like I have multiple inputs so that I can do Twitch and things like that. Now, on the other hand, um, if you want to run GPU acceleration, I advise you to actually run external GPU acceleration. Why is that? There are kind of two ones. Uh, the older one that I use is the Cubix Expander, allows you to have two graphic cards. You can also buy one with four graphic cards. Uh, so I have two Radeon 7s inside of this. Um, and um, you can also run other things. Uh, there was a time that I was running USB 3. I was running a graphic card. I was running like the capture card and I was running uh, another graphic card. So you can run what, as much as you want. You can either run four normal slots or two double sided. So. The reason why I have them external is because the cool thing about having external GPU is that you can switch it off because GPUs take a lot of power, right? 
So you can just keep the regular GPU on the machine, and then you can just switch off when you don't use so much GPUs. Because I'm running three GPUs on my machine, don't forget. So when I don't need them, I just switch them off. So this is the company called Cubix, Cubix Expander. Just contact me if you need links or things like that. If you don't want to buy the Cubix, which is a bit expensive, and it's also very rare, it's very out of stock all the time, you can also get something called the Net Store. The Net Store is the same thing, okay? It's exactly the same thing. Uh, the only thing is that it, this one has uh, four slots of uh, double width PCI. Oh, by the way, these boxes run without drivers, okay? You do not need drivers. It runs on Linux, it runs on Mac, it runs on Windows. No drivers, and this thing is a lot faster than Fundable 3, okay? So Fundable 3 caps out at 40 gigabytes, okay? You can run 128 gigabytes on this, so that's why you can run four GPUs in one slot. So what it does is that it connects to your machine. Basically, there's like a, a host card here, and this host card has a cable, and it connects to the other host card. So basically, inside your machine, you take one slot. It has to be the 16-speed slot. It has to be PCI Express 3 16X. And then you take that slot, and then basically it multiplies to with all the other graphic cards. Uh, obviously, you don't have to. You, I, I really recommend you having multiple GPUs. I do. But if you don't want to buy these boxes... Uh, you can always just put multiple GPUs. Like, for example, the Mac Pro has four slots of 16X. So I can have two Radeon Xs, sorry, two Radeon 7s. I also have the stock Radeon 580X, and then I also have the Afterburner card. So you could do that. You could just, if you have a, a motherboard that can sustain, can sustain, and that's one of my advices here, you should always get a motherboard that has multiple Express slots, you know? And they have to be separated enough for you to be able to actually have multiple graphic cards so they don't touch each other, okay? So as you can see here, they are not touching each other so that they have wind to them. And um, by the way, another thing maybe you don't realize, but if you run Windows, you can actually run uh, both graphic cards because, for example, I'm running dual boot, right? So I am actually running an AMD card for macOS and I'm running an NVIDIA card for Windows. You can do that. So if you really need CUDA, you could run, that's why I love running dual boots and triple boots, because then I can have best of both worlds and I can have as many operating systems as I want. But that's because I just, I, you know, I'm just like an efficient guy. <laughs> anyway, I am talking way too much. I'm sorry about that. So let's move on. Monitors. Monitors, second best thing, right? Hardware was very important. Second best thing for me is monitors. Monitors, monitors, monitors. As you know, I run BenQ monitors. No surprise there because BenQ is doing this webinar. <laughs> so I do love BenQ monitors. Ever since I left the mill has been what I've been using for a long time. It doesn't need to be BenQ, okay? You can run, of course, any monitor you want. But there's a couple of caveats. You kind of want to search monitors that work for you. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm running three monitors. I have the PV series, I have the SW series, and I have the PD series. So the PV series is specifically for video production. I use them because they have pure Rex 9 100%. I use them for previewing my commercials. Um, then I use the SW321C, which is a brand new monitor. Mostly use it for photography and use it for my desktop for Nuke and... It also has um, uh, HDR uh, Plus as well, which is great for playing games and also to preview, not to reference preview HDR, but at least to preview it. Uh, and then I have my third monitor, which is the monitor I use on my trash bin small Mac Pro, just for web, you know, um, office stuff, you know. They all run, like, because I like to be very, very up uh, efficient, and as you can see, I have three of them. Uh, I have, like, the three desktops, here, like one is like a video preview, uh, as you can see on the middle. Then I have like desktop, and then I have another desktop here, and then I have like another video preview. And I like to swap them around depending on my task. Okay, so if I'm doing video, I'm doing other things. So for me to swap them around, I have to get three switches. Okay, very important though. When you run switches, you need to make sure your switches are really high quality. So you, you want to go and get switches that can run 444 full quality 444 uncompressed signal at 60 hertz because a lot of switches out there are 422 they're not 444 i just wanted you to know that so anyway i run three switches i have one which is the four eight port hdmi switch which runs all my gaming rigs then i have the atlana which is my professional 444 hdr chroma sampling 444 for 60 hertz and this is my juno 
which allows me to plug um, most of my connections into my computer so that I can swap them around. And then I have a splitter. This is a splitter that was really cheap. It's a splitter that splits my image for four different monitors. And it, has also, it also runs in 444, 60 hertz. It's very important for you to always make sure you have full quality for everything, okay? Um, okay, so then, of course, I have a couple of switches because some monitors don't have enough HDMI, so I have... A couple of switches, bi-directional switches here and there. Um, really cheap. They're super cheap. They're like 10 quid. Um, and they run anything because they're just passed through. So they can run anything and you just click on them and just switch the signals. I also have some H uh, a USB switch for the audio card. Okay. Now, uh, why do I need so much switches? I need so much switches because I'm basically switching from types of work. Okay. So, for example, here. In here, I'm doing DaVinci. I'm doing color correction on DaVinci. And for this situation, and by the way, this is a, a, a clip from uh, the, a video, a culinary video, a cooking video that I'm doing now. My wife just opened her uh, YouTube channel for vegetarian and vegan recipes. So if you want to go and check it out, it's called Garlic Greens and Companies. We just started it. I'm helping her with it. And it is only vegan and vegetarian if you want to check it out. <laughs> just like plugging it in here. Uh, anyway, <laughs> going back to the studio. So when I'm running... DaVinci Color Correction, I use my middle monitor, which is the SW371C on HDR or Rexon 9, and I use it for color correction with my little spheres here, with my balls. <laughs> and then I have, like, of course, the desktop here, and then on that side, I have my scopes. That's one setup that I have, and then, of course, my, my other scopes. And then, of course, I have, like, my streaming machine here, and then I have another preview here. Now, you're probably asking, why do you have so many scopes and so many monitors? Well, there is a reason for that. I, I like to watch my productions on different outputs. So, for example, on the middle, I'm watching like a true 10-bit high-quality reference monitor. But then on this one, the Blackmagic uh, Smart Display is basically a really crappy 8-bit signal image. You know, it doesn't really look that good, but it's good for you to check how things look on a bad monitor. And then also I have like a really tiny monitor just to check how it looks on an iPhone. I even have a smaller one here that makes me look like a, how it would look on a thumbnail as well. And then I have a black and white monitor here. It's really good for you to watch um, black and white uh, luminance based images so that you can test how they look on luminosity. Uh, now, this is for me when I'm grading. When I'm doing compositing, though, I reverse. So I basically have the desktop on the middle and my preview on the right side now. So. I used to be like that. I used to have the preview on the middle. And now because it's Nuke, I prefer to have Nuke's desktop controls on the middle. I would prefer. Obviously, you can swap it as many times as you want. Uh, and then third but not least, when I'm streaming, it's a bit different. When I'm streaming, I have my lights on. Then I have my microphone on. And then I'm streaming on this machine, which is a streaming machine. It's the OBS. Then I still have Nuke on the middle. And then I have, of course, the the chat from Twitch on either side. I have my streaming, my chat, my Discord, because people are asking me questions on, on streaming all the time. <laughs> and obviously, it's really cool because the Switch is really helping with that. And obviously, the the fact that BenQ has these kind of controllers, external controllers, allow me to change color spaces as well. So if I'm delivering Rexon Zone 9 or if I'm delivering sRGB, I can just swap it around. And the cool thing about it as well is that these monitors are actually fat recalibrated. And um, actually, talking about factory calibration, what I use for calibration, this is really important because don't forget, you don't have an IT department, right? There's no IT department. So you need to do everything by yourself. And so if you have to do everything by yourself, you need to get yourself the best you can. So I use Portrait Display Kalman. You have multiple versions. You have cheap versions like Virtual Forge. You have Studio, Video Pro, or Ultimate. I use Studio. I don't buy the Ultimate. Um, and this allows me to just check the average delta in calibrating my monitors professionally. Now, anything below 1 is amazing. So this monitor is actually 0.4, which is great. Uh, and for that, I use an iDisplay Pro. Uh, for me, I think it's the best one that you can find for the relationship between price and uh, features. It doesn't do HDR, though. Unfortunately, I am about to buy one that does HDR, but this one doesn't. Um, and that also allows me to test the luminosity by section of the monitor. But regardless if you're using BenQ monitors or not, really important for you to understand is that any monitor you get, if you're working from home, okay? Any, this is the tip of the day, okay? <laughs> if you have a monitor that you want to work from home, you want to make sure you have some kind of selection of color spaces. 
the monitor should have at least Rec. 9 and sRGB, because otherwise you're not going to be able to deliver to the web, which is sRGB, and you won't be able to deliver to production commercials on Rec. 9. Obviously, if you can find more profiles like P3 and like HDR, even better. And also, the other thing I would ask you, and this, this again, like I said, it could be any monitor. It can be a BenQ monitor. It could be a Dell monitor. It could be like a like an Aces monitor. It doesn't matter. As long as you can find that it has total control over brightness, contrast, sharpness, gamma, color temperature, hue, saturation, you really want to control it. Otherwise, you won't be able to calibrate it. That's the thing. And, of course, color temperature as well, so you can define the Kelvin temperature as well. It's really important for you to make sure you do that. Otherwise, you'll never be able to get all your monitors to look and match the same. Why is this so important for me, and especially Gamma, by the way? Gamma is super important because then you can deliver 2.2 for the web, 2.4 for commercials, or other Gammas if you're delivering to the cinema or not. It's not only because you want to control totally what you're doing on your monitor, but it's also like a, a way of your eyes not to being in a lot of pain. I have optical nerve damage because of my, you know, crappy monitors I had all my life, and I really would advise you to get some good monitors instead. Uh, so reference monitors, very important for you to kind of think about reference monitors, and this is a big, big thing on the industry because a lot of people think, oh, why would you use reference monitors? Well, I use uh, I use any monitor as a reference monitor, but it's important to understand that I use it separately. I use it with a video card. So if I'm running the Vinci or Nuke, I'm actually running a video card to output the video. Why do I do that? I do that not only because it's easier for me to see full screen playback, because it's easier for me to spot problems, but it also allows me to have 10-bit, 12-bit versus 8-bit if I want to preview it. Now, I have run multiple, multiple, um, you know, multiple graphic cards and multiple uh, uh, video cards in the past. My favorite right now is the Ultra Studio 4 Mini. Why do I love the Ultra Studio 4K Mini? Because it's so little tiny. Look at that. It's next to little Mario here and everything. <laughs> it's like little tiny and it works and it shows me a little thumbnail and it has little numbers and an SD and a volume slider and it has buttons. I love buttons. Um, but the cool thing about it is that it because I love it because it has SDI, it has HDMI 2.0 not 1.4. This is one thing you need to understand. You need to make sure your monitor has HDMI 2.0 so you can run HDR at 60. Otherwise, if it's a monitor with HDMI 1.4, it does not, it only runs at 30 hertz, okay? And this one also has component in. That means I can have analog in. That means if I want to capture VHS, if I want to capture Betacam, or if I want to capture any old console, I can do that as well. That's why it's my favorite so far. And it's portable. I can take it with me. I can take it with me on the road. On the back here, I have HDMI loops. I have HDMI loops. And then, of course, I have I don't have anything on the component yet. And, and it's all driven by Thunderbolt 3. Uh, now, why is this so important? It is important because people need to understand that they cannot preview video content on a regular display, a computer display. Why not? Because video content has multiple formats you know sometimes you're delivering 23.986 frames per second sometimes you're delivering 25 sometimes you're delivering 59.94 sometimes you're delivering 29.97 sometimes you're delivering dci sometimes you're delivering you know uh, 24 sometimes you're delivering psf 29.97 so all these formats video formats including interlaced formats which sometimes i get as well interlaced all of these can only be read if you have a monitor that can play these feed like these actual signals okay that's why running a video card is so important because if you don't run a video card like, you know, like one of these, you know, one of these deck links or ultra studios or it doesn't need to be black magic, but black magic is the cheapest one. If you don't run an actual card like an intensity or an intensity pro or an ultra studio or a deck link, you will never be able to reach these actual precise frame rates and the precision of not only sRGB, but also Rex 9 and also U, uh, IUV, which you cannot even run on a regular display. So that's why when, especially me, I'm delivering a lot of times to editorial, I need to know all these formats. Like just last, last week, I delivered to Amazon Prime and I had to deliver to Amazon Prime on SDR, on HDR, on Rex 9 and on sRGB. And I had to deliver on 29.97, I had to deliver on 30, I had to deliver on 24, I had to deliver all these formats. And without having a video card, I can't deliver those formats, you know. That's why I use a video card. I've been using a video card, guys, for 15 years, okay? All the way back to a Matrox video card. Anyway, you can buy any. Uh, for a long time, I was buying the cheapest one that exists, which is the Decklink Mini Monitor 4K. It's the cheapest one that exists. 
How do you calibrate all of this, though? If you're running an, an, any computer monitor that can actually ex uh, 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 connect to those signals that I just told you about, you want to make sure you calibrate them, okay? So I use a DVDO Avid Lab uh, 4K test pattern generator. Why do I do that? I use the pattern generator because I want to make sure I am calibrating the monitor manually, okay? So obviously this is really expensive. You don't need to buy this, okay? Uh, I bought it because I'm running so much productions through it. If you want a really cheap version, you can just buy the Anforged Video Blu-rays. They have a, a, an HD version and they have an HDR version. These are benchmark Blu-rays, so it allows you to basically benchmark and call it, call it correct and calibrate. You can find them on the website Spears and Monthly uh, Handforged Video. These are Blu-rays that have a lot of color charts and benchmarks for you to actually calibrate your screens if you don't have access to this thing, <laughs> okay, which is a pattern generator. Um, then, of course, we talk about the scopes, and a lot of people don't really know why I do scopes. I do scopes because I want hardware scopes. Obviously, these are most expensive ones. I have three choices for you. The expensive version, the not-so-expensive version, and the cheap, cheap version, okay? The expensive version is hardware scopes. Why do I like hardware scopes? Because it allows me to actually view my video in real time without using the hardware. So basically, my computer is not processing these scopes, you know? I have all the power of my computer and I can just run the scopes through it. The other cool thing about it as well is that any signal can go through it. So if, for example, if I want to watch the scopes on a game, if I want to watch the scopes on a TV show, I can connect to it. And, and, and like I said, I have a black wine version, a color version, and the scopes. Now, if you don't want to buy these real scopes, you can always, and by the way, you need the video card for this to work. You can always go to Drastic Technologies Limited, which have a software that does the same. It's called 4K Scopes. It's not cheap. Like this one is like, I think, uh, 700 pounds. This one is like 400 pounds. You still need a video card to run the display. But a couple of years ago, I was using it. So I was running a video card input on a Mac Mini so that I could... Basically, what I did, I just got a Mac Mini. You can just get a, like a really cheap PC with a graphic card input, like with a video card input, and then run the scopes through there. And it's really professional scopes for you to kind of call the correct and everything. Anyway, if you don't want to buy any of them, the most cheap one is the 100 bucks scope box, okay? Scope box is 100 bucks. It runs all the scopes you need. The cool thing is that it has two functions. You can either run it through a graphic card, sorry, to a capture card, so you can import the signal with SDI or HDMI if you have a video card on the computer. Or if not, you have a link. There's a software link. So if you're running DaVinci, you know, Premiere After Effects, or even um, uh, Final Cut, it actually runs directly on the computer without the need of a, gra of, a of a capture card. Obviously, it takes a lot of CPU power, but most of you have really fast thread rippers. You know, I'm sure you can kill this thing really easily. The coolest thing about the scopes for me as well, there's other softwares out there. Obviously, you can look for other softwares. You don't need to look just for this. You know, and because uh, I believe this specific cheap one is only Mac Mac OS. I think it's only Mac OS. Uh, so you would have to run it on macOS, but there are other options on Windows as well and on Linux as well. Uh, the cool thing as well is that it also has a timing wave waveform, so that means you can see the difference on luminance frame by frame, which is really cool. Uh, now, to add all that up, I also have a, a sound card. I know it sounds so 90s that I have a sound card, <laughs> but I do. I run a sound card because it's preferable than just using the audio that comes on the motherboard. I prefer to have total control over my inputs, okay? So in here, I can control all my different computers, all my PlayStations, all my video cards, and control the volume of them, including outputs with two uh, headphones if I need to test the sound with two people on my studio. Uh, you don't need to buy the big one. I bought the Scarlett 18i20. Um, you know, this is, uh, of course, Foxrite. You can buy other brands, of course. But th this is a good brand. Foxrite is really good. They have the Solo with just one input, and then two inputs, four inputs, eight inputs, 18 inputs, and then the Rack one, which is the one I bought. I bought the Rack one because I just need more inputs than uh, most. <laughs> um, so I also, I don't know anything about sound speakers. Don't ask me that. But I just bought these. I thought they, would, they were cool. They are really high quality. They're Mackie sound speakers. I have them on either side, one side and on the other side with my little toys. Headphone-wise, I have professional headphones because I'm running voiceovers and podcasts and videos and professional videos. So I think in person, my, my personal view is that Bayer Dynamic is the best out there. 
Obviously, they have a lot of different ones. You don't need to buy Biodynamic. You can buy others, but I, I like Biodynamic. I have the 77 DT, and I have the 90, 90, 90, 990 DT as well. These ones are closed, so that means they're really good for just regular uh, reviewing. Uh, these ones are open, so that means that they're really good for professional monitoring. Um, they're really expensive, of course, but you have several versions, cheap ones. You can just buy the DT240 if you don't want to buy the the one, the 990 or the 770, okay? So there are several versions. And as you can see, some of them are open, some of them are closed, and that's really because I they have different, um, they have different, you know, this one is for control and monitoring. This is for mixing, okay? So it's that's different tasks. That's why I have two of them. The cool thing about this is that you can, you know, when they get really sweaty, <laughs> and they do get really sweaty, you can swap them around so you can have biodynamic little uh, ear pads. You can just swap them around. I already swapped like three of them. And last but not least, a little tip of the day as well. These little contractions I have here. I hate having my headphones fall to the ground. So what I did was I bought these things. Uh, these are 360 swivels. They are... I just bought them on Amazon. Um, they are clear lock headphone headset stand holders. Um, um, and they're just cool. They just rotate and you can connect the cabling into it as well. They're really cheap. They're like five bucks, I think, or seven bucks. Anyway, let's move on. Storage. <laughs> Storage, what do I run here and what should you run? I'm running a RAID system. I'm running a, a Lassie 12 uh, Big. My main storage, uh, 48 terabytes of storage. Um, and then I'm running also a secondary storage, which is the Call Digit T3. You saw them on my travels. I was carrying them around around the world. Now they are my secondary storage. So I have this RAID connected to the trash bin and this one connected to the new Mac Pro. Um, so basically, I like the last C12 storage because it's really fast. That's why. And also the Call, the call Digit is also really fast. Now, how fast is it? Like the, the, the last C can run about almost 2,000 megs a sec on read almost 1500 on write almost which is more than enough for you to play back anything really now if you're really really serious like me on caching on davinci nuke resolve uh, on after effects if you really need a lot of caching and um, and even maybe even simulations everything i would advise you to have an external like like an actual pci card for uh, blades these work on windows linux or mac this is the high point one on the top, and the one on the bottom is the Sonnet. These are basically 16 full-length speed PCI cards that can run four M2 SDI SSDs, okay? So you can run really fast. My favorite is the iPoint SSD7101A1. <laughs> That's a mouthful. They run Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Why is my favorite? This is my favorite one because it's hardware, okay? So because it's hardware, if you have a rate system, it keeps the same RAID on Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you run the Sonnet, it's software rated. So if it's software rated, if I boot to Windows, I lose my RAID. So it is better to have hardware RAID. Now, these are just running four um, uh, 97 EVOs, um, and they run around 10,000 megs a sec on read, and they run around 8,000 megs on write. Now, the reason I have them here is because now I can play back 8K on HDR, 10-bit, and I can play HD without even sweating. And it's like, <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's nuts how fast it is. Obviously, you don't need to do these kind of things. You know, I, as you can see, I have like these hard drives, which are hard drive. That if you wish, you can use a network drive. I don't like it because network drives are much slower. They never really reach the speed I want. So I prefer to run faster hard drives. For backup, I use, of course, Dropbox as my frozen backup. Um, but I would also advise you to get some tape backup. This is really cheap. It's a, LTO is a standard for backup. Uh, we are currently on LTO 8. This one is the older one, LTO 5, which is two, 3 terabytes. Uh, the new one is 12 terabytes, I think. So each tape is 1.5 terabytes and then compressed and 3.0 terabytes compressed. They're really cheap. They're like 15 quid. And you can record them on these really old recorders. Uh, you just need to buy them uh, used. And then you, you can use you can buy a cleaning tape so you can clean. It's like a VHS tape. But the cool thing about this is that it really lasts a long time. If you keep these tapes on a well-organized uh, house, they can probably last 30 years, uh, maybe 20. I bought it, again, eBay, eBay to the rescue. eBay, you, I find most of my stuff on eBay. <laughs> this is really cheap. It's like you can find it for like 200 quid. Uh, this one was 200 quid, this this actual Dell recorder. It's like 10 years old, but it doesn't really matter. You know, internet, really quick tip here. 
if you are serious of working home, you really want to take it seriously to a point that you have two connections. Uh, why do I have two connections? Because I want to have a backup connection, okay? So I have two fiber connections. I have a business fiber connection and I have a consumer fiber connection. They're from two different manufacturers and two different brands so that they don't connect. And then, of course, I have certain computers connected to one of the fiber, other computers connected to the other fiber, depending on what I'm doing. Then, of course, I have like a, an internet switch with 10 gig. 10 gig is really cool because it runs around 340 megabytes on write, around 200. This is a bit slow because I was doing other things, but it runs really well on the network so I can connect all my three machines so they all can read through that hard drive. Now, also another device would be Spitify. Spitify allows you to basically merge the connection. So that means that you can merge these two routers as one. So that means instead of each of these do 300 megs of download and they do 20 of upload. So that means I can do 600 of download and 40 of upload. And that's amazing for London. OK, some of you live in London and you know how hard it is for Internet here. Now, pipeline. I'm not going to talk about the pipeline a lot because we I have so many videos on YouTube about that. I talk on Twitch all the time about that. My my pipeline currently is like this. Nuke, Mari, Redshift for rendering, Final Cut, Udini, Photoshop, Maya, Modo, F-Track, Nuke Studio, Skype, and Dropbox. That's my pipeline currently. And F-Track is the way I preview and send to clients all my reviews so they can give me feedback. And I use F-Track Studio to track my production so that I can have my teams. Like I said, my teams sometimes run to 20 people. So uh, input devices, really important. I currently use an LED, um, LED keyboard. Why do I use an LED keyboard? I really would advise you to use LEDs because you can see them on the dark. That's the main thing. Editor Keys sells uh, keyboards for almost every software, except Nuke, sad face. Uh, but they sell it for almost one. This is the Final Cut one because that's the one I use for editing. Uh, I also use Stream Deck. I use Stream Deck for uh, shortcuts while I'm streaming. As you can see here, I have my timer, my intermission, my web chat and everything. But I also use it for clips and I also use it for Nuke. So when I'm grading or CC, I have like certain shortcuts to it uh, inside Drap, uh, uh, Stream Deck. Now, this is not new. Like, if you look at this guy here, this is Joe Diana. I found this on the online. And as you can see, he has a really nice DaVinci Resolve studio here. And look at this. He has one, two, three, four stream decks. And he has a ton of different things on the stream decks. Look at that. That is really cool. I didn't even realize until I saw this that you could actually run so many stream decks at the same time. If you want, I've never used it, but you can also use Loop Deck. Loop Deck is really cool because you can use it as a shock shuttle. And it also has that tactile feeling. You know, you can kind of move the sliders and move color correction and luminosity and brightness. And I really like this, this kind of thing. And um, also for video, I'm an old school video uh, because I back in the day, like 20 years ago, I was editing video to video. So I use a jog shuttle. The jog shuttle allows me to go frame by frame with my finger and I can rotate and go and play back and stop. And of course, color correction, I use the cheapest, cheapest color surface exists in the world. I think it's $250. Uh, this is the tangent. So this is my setup when I'm doing color correction. This is what I have. I have in here my shortcuts. I have my keyboard, then I have my uh, my grading spheres, I have my jog shuttle uh, in my mouse. When I'm doing compositing or visual effects, I switch to a Wacom tablet. So I kind of go from one to the other, one to the other, one to the other, <laughs> depending on the job I'm doing. And the same goes for the monitors, I switch them as well. Obviously, you need to get a webcam. I really would suggest you to get a Logitech 4K Brio. I have two of them. They are good because 4K is the future, and also it's a great way for your clients to see you uh, sharp. You know, <laughs> I also have, of course, a professional microphone. This is the Rod Podcaster. That's the monitor I use. So I use it for, of course, for tutorials, for video casts, for pretty much anything. Uh, anyway, lighting, very important subject. Lighting for me, it's in super important because you want to control, have total control over everything you have on your studio. So this is my studio when I switch all my lights off. So I only have the screens. Then, of course, I have a backlight there. I have my Elgato lights and I have my secondary light on this side. Then I have my BenQ bar. So if I want, I can just have a little bit of backlight if I'm doing grading and maybe a side light. If I really want, I can have a lot of light if I'm just like working on browsing or something like that. And it's really good for your eyes, of course. If I'm streaming, of course, I activate my Elgato lights. And then, of course, I can change them to blue to red if I prefer, of course. 
the key lights from Elgato are really cool. I, I like them. Of course, you don't need to buy them. You can buy whatever like you per, light you prefer. The reason why I have lights is not just because of the webinars and not just because of the tutorials, but also because, you know, I feel like like it's good for my clients to to see me, <laughs> you know, to to actually see me. And uh, so that's why. Um, anyway, the key light is cool because you can adjust it really easily. And the best thing for it, it has total control on desktop and total control on your phone. So you can control the temperature, the brightness and everything. I also have like a crappy light on the back here. It's an articulated LED light. It has a little remote as well, <laughs> so you can control it. And as you can see, it's like just a LED desk lamp. It's dimmable. It has several color temperatures as well which is cool, and it's articulated, so you can move it. And then, of course, I have another side light, just a cheap light from Amazon. Again, just try to find lights that can change temperatures. So this one can do to uh, 2,700 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, which is good. I have three of these all around my studio. And then last but not least, I have the BenQ light, the BenQ bar. I love the BenQ bar. It's really cool because it has total control over the uh, temperature and light. And look at this. It can be put on the actual monitor. And this is it on. This is it off. You see? Nothing. Not even one reflection on the screen. Not even one. And I, I love that. I love the fact that this light can be on and I can eliminate my keyboard and everything. And I don't see my screen being affected. And this is, these are really cool. I don't even think they're that expensive. They're like 100 bucks or something. Um, and the cool thing, this works because the light direction is actually going to the front. You see? It actually, the cone of light is onto the front. That's why it works so well. Now, anyway, last but not least, ergonomics. I'm gonna not going to spend too much time on this, but... Please, for the love of God, and I'm not even religious, try your best to have a very good chair. Now, I don't say you should buy an expensive chair. This chair was like $400. Uh, and the reason I bought it was because it has a headrest and it's all net. That means I don't sweat and it has a lot of breathing space when I'm sitting on my chair. Now, this is called the new chair. I really like it. I bought it like last year. Previously, I have a sciatica back problem, as some of you know, which gives me a lot of pain. Uh, so if you have sciatica back problems, I would really recommend you to get a varier variable ballast. But these are amazing because you can rock yourself forwards and backwards and you can kind of rest your knees. I really love that. Now, <laughs> of course, last but, not, last but not least, I have a mouse pad. Look at look. Just look at it. It's Doom. Doom, the best game in the world. <laughs> it's so soft as well. Um, and my mouse. I had a lot of mouses in my life, but I have so many problems with my sciaticas that the best mouse I've ever had was this, the MX Vertical Ergonomical Mouse. And the reason for that is because it really allows you to have less strain on your muscles, okay? Now, let's just talk about Michelinians so we can wrap up this stream and go to the questions. So, Michelinians, you probably noticed that I have a bunch of little metal boxes, right? Where can you find those metal boxes, you're probably asking. Well, I find them online, on eBay. Again, eBay is always the best. So, there's a shop on eBay called All Metal Parts. Uh, I, I can guarantee you that I don't get paid by them. And they have everything professional for 19-inch racks. You should know the industry standard is 19-inch racks. So you can buy shelves. You can buy also rack boxes on different sizes. 10U, 2U, 24U. You can buy multiple them. And that's how I make these little rack boxes. I can put my displays. And because I live in London, I have such a tiny office, I can really optimize my space by having, for example, the scopes below the monitor. So that when I'm looking at the monitor, I can look at the scopes as well. And as you can see, they are all customizable. I can put rack, I can route mount my network. I can route mount my connections. I can mount everything really on them. And the cool thing is that they are all so flexible. I can mount them on top of each other. So you see, this is one, two, three. And I can keep going on top, of course, if I wanted to, <laughs> um, which is really cool. And they also allow you to rack mount like sound cards. And because they are metal, look at this. Look at this little, little DOI tip. You know these little really annoying uh, SD card readers? Uh, this is the SF Fast 2 card reader for my Blackmagic cards. I just put like some little magnetic stickers on it and boom, it's attached. It never will leave that place. It's boom. And uh, also, don't forget electricity. This is really tricky. You really need to be careful because I have so much stuff here. 
I have two UPSs. UPSs is a way for you, to, if you if your power goes down, the computer keeps going, you know, at least for a couple of minutes. I have one UPS on one side try, uh, taking care of one of my Mac Pros, and I have another UPS taking care of my other Mac Pro. So it's really, of course, complex. You have to be, you have to be almost like a scientist to try to get this to work. But please, for the love of God, do not do this, okay? This is not going to work. <laughs> this is going to be a fire alert, a fire hazard, so be careful. And also, this is not good. Please try to not to do this. So I would advise you really to research a lot about electricity. Maybe even get an electrician to with you. Maybe even measure the electricity. I do that all the time. I use these LECD measures of electricity to see what my my sockets can do. And then I do a lot of calculations and I calculate how much, you know, PlayStation is 150 watts. The PlayStation 3 is 88 watts. And then the monitor is 50 watts. And then the computer is 1,000 watts. Like I start to connect to my sockets on UK, which are 3,000 watts each. So it's really important for you to calculate and split the wattage. Then another really big advice. Make sure you get cable ties and get Velcro cable ties. They're like seven pounds and there's 60 of them. As you can see, if I didn't put Velcro on this thing, I would lose my mind. So I Velcro everything. I can attach everything. Obviously, once you attach everything like this, it becomes really organized because nothing is loose on the floor. But you need to start thinking about labeling things. Otherwise, you don't know what it is. So I label everything. I have labels everywhere. Not to mention I have like a little basket tray on the back of the computer. These are really cheap basket trays you can buy on Amazon. And then you can put all the cables on the trays. Look at that. And so that means that all the cables are not on the floor. So if you have to vacuum clean, you have the floor empty of cables. Look at that. There's no cable on the floor. Or your cats also don't go and destroy your cables as well. So basket trays are really good. Also, it allow. I also get like horizontal switched uh, power surges. So I buy a lot of these. So because they not only they are protecting my power surge, but as you can see here, I have multiple of them. Okay. So each of my boxes, I have one here, one there, one there, one there. And the cool thing about this is, if I'm not using, for example, on any of these consoles, I can just switch it off. If I'm not using these consoles, I can just switch it off. And if I'm using these consoles, I can switch it on. So it allows you to switch off and back and that kind of save some power, really. And then, of course, USB uh, hubs. I have one on each side of the room so that I can plug anything I want from a client. And these little self-adhesive cable labels, waterproof, that you can kind of label everything. Because there are so many cables around, you really need to label, okay? So I label everything so that I know each USB cable, each HDMI, each display port, what it is, where it came from. As you can see, this is from the 6.1 Mac Pro. This is from the 7.1 Mac Pro. This is from the gaming rig. And also the networking, you know which one is it. Because if you need to troubleshoot, this is the only way you're going to troubleshoot anything, is if you know where it came from. And don't forget a little vacuum cleaner so that you can clean your keyboard. <laughs> I love my little vacuum cleaner and, of course, my fan. I have it here with me as well. The cool thing about this little fan is that this fan is wireless. Look at that. It has a little battery. Uh, now, let's wrap up with relaxation. What do I do to relax? Of course, I play games. <laughs> That's what I do. So I have my PlayStation. The, re the reason I do that is because I collect old games, so I have all the consoles. And I'm capturing them because I do videos online for them. I'm thinking of Twitch streaming some of them, so that's why I have all of them racked like this. So on the top, I have my PlayStations, 4, 3, 2, 1, and my Wii, and then I have my Sega Saturn, my GameCube, my Panasonic 3DO, uh, my Dreamcast, my Sega Mega Drive, Mega CD, and 3DX Combo, my Xbox Original, and then I have like the Nintendo 64, the Jaguar 64, the Amiga CD32, uh, the CDI Philips. I'm the only person in the world that hasn't. <laughs> I'm joking. And then I have, of course, the Switch and the Wii U and my little micro consoles as well, which I love, and my little micro PS1. On the bottom there, also, of course, I have controllers for all of them as well. On the other side of my desk, I have my books, and they're all related to my work. So I have my lenses, my cameras. Of course, I have all my art of books, all my Cinefax, all my books that give me inspiration. I have like, I collect art books because they, they really drive inspiration when I'm doing a job. Or I, of course, I have composting books as well. I also, of course, have multiple books from films, from filmmakers. A lot of books from Stanley Kubrick, as you can see here. Uh, a lot of games, of course. A lot, a lot of games uh, because you saw the consoles. And that's it, really. 
No, I can't believe it. We got to the end. And that's it. Try to have fun. Look at me. I'm having fun here with a Yugo, <laughs> which is the worst car in the world. And of course, try to have fun as much as you can. As you can see here, I have always multiple versions of myself doing a lot of different things. Thank you so much for watching this. And here's the Q&A now.